and um, welcome to the Peace and Justice Studies annual this year virtual con conference. We normally meet in September or October, but this year we decided we'd go virtual and we'd spread our sessions out over the months of September, October, and November. September was restorative justice, and this month, October, is storytelling and social justice. Uh, my name is Michelle Collins Sibley. I'm a member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association board and the committee that brought you this year's conference. Tonight is the penultimate program in the October series called Symbols and Structures, Stories That Move. This is a presentation grounded and inform in and informed by the Resist Violence Project, an interdisciplinary pedagogy bringing art, storytelling, and the work of social change into the classroom. Uh, it features four participants, Pat Romano, who started in political science, but is teaching and researching in an interdisciplinary fashion. She's been teaching courses on war and peace in the humanities department at Dawson College since 1991. She's uh, one of the two co-founders of the Resist Violence Project. Kim Simard, a teacher, filmmaker, and community activist who has worked and presented globally. She is the other co-founder of the Resist Violence Project, and she's currently involved in a range of pedagogical projects in Montreal. Alison Reiko Loder researches media history and makes art. She has directed animated short films for the National Film Board of Canada and currently teaches design and animation history at Concordia University and production in Dawson College's 3D animation and CGI program. And lastly, Susan Elmsley, who has taught English and creative writing at Dawson College full-time since 2003. Her most recent collection of poetry, Museum of Kindness, which came out in 2017, was shortlisted for the A.M. Klein Prize and the Pat Lowther Award. She has served as a juror for the 2020 Montreal International Poetry Prize and has been a Hawthorne Den Fellow. So I will almost immediately turn us over to our wonderful group of panelists. Uh, they're providing us with a sort of performance piece via Zoom. And at the end of the piece, we'll have a question and answer period with, I'm told, opportunities for direct exp experience of the pedagogy. I'd suggest that you submit your questions to the chat and we'll proceed from there. So I'll turn it over to you, panelists. Thank, Thank you very much. What if the classroom worked like a nonviolent movement? Educators assume resistance from students and work to engage from an emotional place to encourage openness to new perspectives. What if the, what if the class took a multidisciplinary approach, embracing theoretical, creative, and research-based perspectives and practices? What if students were invited to be the expert asked to be storytellers, artists, and activists. What if vulnerability and surprise were embraced, acknowledged, and studied? What if students made educated choices about which forces to resist? This is what nonviolent movements can do. Is this what classrooms can do too? Like Bell Hooks writes, first off, can everyone see this? Okay, I just wanna make sure, okay. Like Bell Hooks writes, I celebrate teaching that enables, enables transgressions, a movement against and beyond boundaries. It is that movement which makes education a practice of freedom. Silences. Realities we ignore, ideas that normalize what should never be normalized. Stories we tell ourselves to avoid disturbing truths. Connections we refuse to make. Violence happens to others, people who in some way have come to deserve it. We don't do violence, they do. Some of these forms of denial were shattered, at least for a time, on a fall day in 2006, 
when an armed gunman walked into Montreal's Dawson College, intent on ending lives, his own included connections. At the time, I was sitting in my office, talking to a student on his upcoming assignment on the global arms trade, more connections. Our reflection was interrupted by a group of terrified students running down the corridor, informing us that someone was shooting two floors down. We took shelter in the office, hunkering down for an hour or two, until the police finally ordered us to leave, arms above our heads, walking fast, even running at times, on a route to the college, presumably made safe by nervous young police officers with guns at the ready, passing through a pool of blood, more blood than I had ever seen, left by the young male shooter who had shot himself in the throat after being hit by a police officer's bullet. The incident has marked me, not because of my shock that there has been another mass shooting at a school in Montreal, but perhaps yes, because it was my college. Surprised also by my capacity to shut down reality. For the entire duration of being locked down in my office, I never really thought for a moment that particular people, perhaps my own students, were being shot just outside. I understood it was a coping mechanism to ensure I could stay strong for myself, but also for the scared students now my responsibility. But still, it was a lesson. I remember the feeling on the bus ride home afterwards were strangers, some like the student next to me who talked to me in whispers, and others who just knew that something devastating had happened, felt connected in some profound, but not quite explicable way as Montrealers, as Canadians, as human beings. But the biggest impact of this experience has been on my teaching, shaped my commitment to this pedagogy, to finding ways, effective ways, to break through our forms of denial, find connections across the myriad of us's and them's we build, we all build, and engage my students in actively resisting the ideas that justify violence against others. I learned another lesson in the weeks following the shooting while I was in the classroom. The semester was difficult. So many of us had students who had been injured or knew someone who had been shot or were friends with Anastasia de Souza, the young woman just beginning her college studies who had been killed. Or with James Santos, the young man who had spoken with the gunman, pleading him not to shoot her a second time, saying, you don't need to be doing this. There are other ways. I can help you. Everyone was on edge. Any sudden loud noise made people jump. Rumors flew, including one about a black trench coat left outside the college with a note saying, Dawson, it's not over. In this context, I was teaching a course on the issue of war and peace. It was going well. Students expressed that they were glad I was not avoiding the topic of the shooting. But then as I began to talk about how a person can become capable of taking another human life, how militaries turn recruits into soldiers ready for battle, my usually engaged students went silent. I looked at them like deers in the headlights and I felt so irresponsible, so foolish. How could I have gone this far? After class, I hurried to talk to one of the trauma counselors we had on campus. Her words have remained with me since. Yes. One of your students might be triggered by the material in the classroom, but if they were, then they would be triggered at some point. There are potential triggers everywhere. And if it happens while at school, there is support for them. And your class, what you are teaching is so very, very important. You are helping your students to understand what happened. And understanding makes healing possible. Don't stop. Our presentation called Stories, Symbols, Structure, sorry, <laughs> Symbols, <laughs> oh gosh, our presentation called Symbols, Structures, and Stories That Move, The Galvanizing Power of the Resist Violence Pedagogy, is a collaboration by members of an interdisciplinary community of practice uh, for the Resist Violence Pedagogy. It's a collaboration uh, that, took, that takes place at Dawson College in Montreal. The initiative was founded by me, hi, um, Kim Smog, I teach in cinema communications, and Pat Romano, who you heard just talk about her experience um, with the Dawson shooting, who teaches in humanities. Pat and I have been practicing resist violence pedagogy with students that we share across two, two disciplines um, for since around 2016. Last year, we welcomed instructors from four other departments uh, to help us explore and expand our methods into other fields. 
Today, we are joined by poet and English teacher Sue Elmsley and Alison Loder from uh, 3D Animation. Together, we'll travel with, uh, through multiple voices and moving stories. Our journey, roughly sectioned into three parts, mirrors the developments we experience as teachers and uh, that we see in our students. Our trip begins and proceeds with uncertainties and setbacks, yet forming a we and all the challenges and rewards that in, that entails enables us to travel from isolation to connection. It prepares us for the last leg of our journey when we move towards change, agency, empowerment, and resistance. At the end of our presentation, I will briefly introduce the Resist Violence website and some of the resources on it. Uh, and our time together will conclude with your comments and questions. But first, let's continue with silences and resistances. Silences, silence, anger, disengagement, denial, each a common psychological process that can be activated automatically when we are faced with something that challenges our existing ideas and values. In states of denial, sociologist Stanley Cohen emphasizes the ordinariness of denial, arguing that the interesting question is not why do we shut out, but why do we ever not shut out? Cohen explores the human tendency to deny more fully in describing some of the different forms denial can take. For example, in regards to what exactly is being denied, this could imply that the facts themselves, as in um, climate change isn't happening, the full ex or the full significance of what happened, as in it wasn't rape, or a dismissal or minimization of the psychological, political, or moral implications that should follow, as in, this all happened in the past, let's just move on. The very persistence of denial reveals the difficulties of creating a classroom environment where students open up to new ideas, particularly when they connect to systems of privilege and disadvantage. In such a case, how productive is it to tell them they are wrong by repeating one more time the facts? Stop me, oh, oh, stop me. Stop me if you think that you've heard this one before. A teacher wants to bring up a social issue that has a multitude of complexities and censors himself for fear that conflict will erupt. Or a past experience of a student hijacking the class with, about racism with all lives matter rhetoric proved too harmful for the students, becoming a taboo topic in a teacher's repertoire. A teacher is evaluated for being too political or controversial and moves their practice and research away from a topic they are passionate about. I was a young teacher going over the impact media has on culture in the context of an intro level communications class. As we started a brief discussion to encourage participation, we talked about sports and the ads that enforce unrealistic concepts of ma masculinity. All was seemingly going well, students were interested, provoked in a way I anticipated. Then I explicitly made the link to those kinds of messages and rape culture. A very disturbed young man in the back blurted out, there's no such thing as rape culture, come on. The class went silent and with time running out, I tried to wrap up the conversation by asking why this was something he felt strongly about. He responded by leaving the room. For the week that followed, I tried to find every piece of media that I could to prove how real rape culture was. There was the YouTube video gone viral at the time uh, with the Halifax Frosh Week group chanting, no means yes, yes means anal. Uh, one of many examples I was prepared to show to the class to prove something I assumed most had already accepted. He didn't show, um, he dropped um, or switched, who knows, it kind of, it really affected me. 
um, his fragility actually really struck me as well. And his extreme reaction made me a bit scared. So I started censoring myself in class. Uh, I skated around terms I thought might be too offensive. I tried to find ways to justify this approach, even though it was truly not one that suited me and was not particularly effective. Events in the college community and beyond kept probing me as though to defy me, to keep squelching my voice and my commitment to engagement in the classroom with the issue that affects us all, with this issue that affects us all. I learned uh, that a colleague had made the wrong move with a student uh, when they tried to make a sexual assault claim. Um, he said something along the lines of, you're a very attractive young lady, thought you'd be used to these kinds of advances. And then there was this. And then I was in the Metro and uh, I saw an ad that looked similar to this. And then, uh, you know, I was at a welcome back event and there was another colleague who uh, said, you know, that even Margaret Atwood believed that women needed to be held more accountable for all the false stories they spread about sexual assault. She also spurted some kind of overblown percentage of false sexual assault claims. So in my desperation or my attempt to bring this back into the classroom, I tentatively showed something like this. Oh my God, is that image really being presented in class right now? Yes, I know about this campaign. Are we gonna study this? <laughs> Panties. Not more about consent. We did the stupid workshop. Why can't we just get over it? Oh, I wish the artist hadn't used pink. This is so thong. In our community of practice, we discuss ways to frame violence to promote psychological safety for all. So just for providing a wider historical and cultural perspective, whether in terms of pulling apart the language to reveal how the meaning of words change in time, place, and culture, or by looking at the deep historical roots of systems that continue to privilege some at the expense of others. We explore the value of drawing out interconnections between different forms of violence, shifting from the personal to safer academic discussions and vice versa, and using art and storytelling to bring the element of surprise into the classroom so that students' psychological defenses are not already in place, filtering out material that's too threatening. While we explore the harm inflicted by structural and cultural forms of violence in a resist violence classroom, we never assume who is privileged in our classroom and recognize that those most resistant to social justice issues, typically white heterosexual young men, are often themselves feeling overwhelmed by their insecurities, shaped by such experiences as early abuse, relentless bullying or family poverty, and buttressed by harmful expectations about masculinity. Essentially, we asked the community of practice participants to wonder whether, as Allison phrased it, I would become a more effective pedagogue if I made a greater effort to better understand why some students resist me. This was bringing everyone to what is perhaps most interesting, but also provocative about the resist violence pedagogy, specifically its foundation in the theory and practice of nonviolence. Nonviolent theorists call for us to maintain distinction between an individual, and their actions or ideas. Acknowledge the possibility for all of us to change profoundly and inspire us to see ourselves in the other. In other words, to look for the we rather than the us and them. How is finding the we possible in a classroom? For we is the one pronoun, pronoun I ask students to avoid unless they're working as a team. The I demands positionality, and the you is a call to engagement. We makes me suspicious. When I hear or see that word, I worry about the elision of multiple points of view, the oversimplification of an argument, and can't help but think, how pretentious. I associate it with royalty and their odd affectations, and students invariably giggle as I explain this aversion. 
In an article called The Politics of We, Mary Anna Targovnik argued that, quote, the we as a rhetorical device either ignores or demonizes individuals who, or groups it excludes and comments that repressive politics of inclusion obliges members to deny parts of themselves. In the early 1990s, when that was written, some were already criticizing the emerging diversity in school curricula and attacking affirmative action. The term politically correct had recently emerged. Weaponized as a defense of free speech, speech accusations of political correctness justify hurtful language and ideas, shame anyone trying to oppose them, and ignore differences of opinion among those the term targets. Its usage dates to a 1990 Newsweek article, and in that same year, the Atlantic magazine would excerpt Dinesh D'Souza and his efforts to defend an elitist utopian cultural we. <coughs> Excuse me. D'Souza opposed newer fields, for example, feminist, gender, and queer studies, postcolonial, and peace studies. Well, when, when cultural protectionism appears in the realm of academia, it is not difficult to imagine ensuing restrictions on immigration and other forms of economic, social, or educational exclusion just as the protection of hate speech under the guise of academic freedom suggests that systemic racism will elsewhere be denied. Sometimes cultural critics and other writers rhetorically employ the pronoun we and its stand-ins to shield their own sense of difference. Born and raised in Bombay and gaining an American citizenship as an adult in 1991, D'Souza is an immigrant person of color that performs as a minority spokesperson for a dominant elite. A still very active neocon conspiracy theorist and propagandist, he has even been pardoned by the current American president for making illegal campaign contributions. Apologists like D'Souza work on behalf of white patriarchy for individual gain and will instrumentalize their own apparent difference to shield them from criticism. People of color, like me, must acknowledge that there are multiple ways that we can be caught up in systemic racism and reflect on our own motivations and actions. On much smaller scales, and even within group politics that are far less repressive, there can be internalized pressure to play nicely. Microaggressions may be swallowed because we consider them unconscious acts, especially when a perpetrator is perceived as well-intentioned and more powerful. Yet minor offenses are symptomatic of structural inequalities that accumulate and hurt. There is emotional labor and a cost regardless of whether a person lets things slide or addresses them directly. Must one speak up? Should they keep quiet? What do they owe themselves to the community they come from, to the community they aspire to? My own family silently accepted wartime internment and post-war relocation, and like numerous North Americans of Japanese descent that endured similar conditions, they quickly assimilated to embody the myth of the model minority, internalizing the message that the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. But here's what my other internal voice is saying. Why is it my job to explain to you how racism works or how I identify? And why are you with me if I try? I thought we were friends and here I am just trying to enjoy this pint with you. So I wonder about students of color and other visible differences during classroom discussions of identity, representation and cultural violence seeing them silent, sinking into their seats, perhaps hoping to disappear, worried like me that something awful or insensitive might be said, that they will be expected to weigh in and that they might offend someone themselves. I cannot help but identify with them. So we cannot assume that any we pre-exists, that we are in agreement and working to the same end or that a we that ignores internal differences can or should be protected. 
Yet collective action is essential to affect lasting change. To build a we from disparate parts is a challenging, painful, courageous, and perhaps unending process. Still, the only we's that attract me or that I consider even possible are polyvocal, self-banking, transformative and transforming arrangements of diverse actors that respect, listen, challenge, and learn from one another. Those we's need to be cherished, nurtured, and open to expansion. I was teaching the poetic form known as the villanelle, a tightly structured 19 line poem with two repeating refrain lines. We had already considered the most famous examples, Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night and Elizabeth Bishop's One Art. And we were considering some contemporary examples in preparation for an upcoming in-class essay students were to write. When I showed a villanelle called Larkspur by my friend Rachel Rose and published in her collection, Giving My Body to Science, things heated up in the class. The poem speaker recounts to a woman named Ellen, who the poem is dedicated to, what happened when Ellen was moving into her first apartment in Brooklyn. Clearly, Ellen was attacked by a stranger, nearly choked and sexually assaulted. The poem speaker says, the door was left ajar. He forced your legs apart. Ellen was left with, quote, finger marks on her throat. In our discussion of the dramatic situation of the poem, that's who's speaking to who and under what circumstances, uh, one student, a young woman, took issue when I said that Ellen was sexually assaulted. She put down her pen and spoke up. She was raped. Raped. She was raped, she said. Suddenly, this was a discussion about more than a poem. The tension in the room was palpable. Perched on the edge of a table at the front of the classroom, I could feel my adrenaline kick up. What was at stake here? Did the student perceive in my use of the term sexual assault an effort to deny a victim? Deny a victim's experience? Or sanitize what happened to her? I was definitely being challenged and with a degree of hostility. I don't know if I answered in the best way. I forgot to take a breath. I could feel my heart pounding and my face was probably serious or stern looking. I didn't disagree with the student. It is a poem about rape, but I first defended my use of the term sexual assault. Canada has a broad definition of sexual assault. It includes unwanted sexual activity, um, such as unwanted sexual grabbing, kissing and fondling, as well as rape. Then I pointed to the poem, quote, he forced her legs apart. We can surmise what happened, I said, but that's all the poem says overtly. I might have and should have invited the student to make her case, point to other evidence in the poem to support her assertion. What evidence is there? What's missing? What inferences can we reasonably make? In the best of possible worlds, she would have pointed out that in the fourth stanza, the poem speaker says to Ellen, quote, the evidence was intact. You were his scapegoat. Your family was called to the emergency ward, which suggests that Ellen might have undergone an, um, an evidentiary exam or rape kit. I sensed that approaching the poem in this moment sort of clinically, treating it purely analytically by focusing on evidence might have been construed as a challenge to the victim. I feared giving this impression, not sure if I was capable in the moment of saying that this is precisely one of the things that Rachel Rose highlights in her poem, the problematic way that sexual assault survivors are treated after a crime for which there are statistically very few convictions. The poem um, has a line, who walked out was never caught. 
and how despite collective efforts to deny or erase the trauma, it recurs for the survivor like the refrains of the villanelle form itself. I tell students that the moments they snag on in a poem are the most significant. As Robert Frost said, the poem is nicked for meaning here. But I was near the end of the class, it was near the end. And we stopped before resolving our discussion. Though part of me wished we could return to the discussion at the beginning of our next class, that would be the brave thing to do. We couldn't, the next class was the scheduled exam. The class after that, it would have been just awkward, I told myself. Did I lose an opportunity to, dis to discuss what was really at stake in the students' resistance to my characterization of what happened? This was before the Me Too movement, but we could all feel the rising tide. Did I settle on a legalistic defense? Reading poems is about considering the evidence in the poem, I thought. But how did the woman who asked the question and how did everyone else in the class feel about our exchange? Well, we are all a work in progress. In reconceptualizing complicity in the social justice classroom, Michelano Zimbalas argues that we need to stop treating complicity as a problem to be solved and start treating it as a fact of our civic life to learn to live with. He adds, this implies, for instance, that rather than structuring our lives in ways that focus on avoiding complicity altogether, we should recognize that this is an inevitable aspect of political life and we are all already complicit in all kinds of ways to unjust acts. Megan Bowler agrees, noting that education is not effective if it is combative and alienating, adding that if as, educa if, if as educators we shatter someone's familiar and comfortable worldview, in compassion, we need to replace the vacuum with something else. Thimbalus responds, if the issue is how to handle white students' denial of complicity, the pedagogical question at hand is not, what can I as a teacher do to reaffirm students' moral agency so that they admit their complicity? But rather, how can I as a teacher move my students to take action in their everyday lives to refuse being complicit in social harm? On Facebook, a former student of mine posted in despair, I can't take all of this bad news. I want to just crawl into a ball and try to forget about the state of the world. I replied, have you tried focusing on the resistance to these things? Photos can evoke our emotions and, self, and provide self-reflection. And they can also reflect change as well as usher in more positive changes. A young man in my class um, had an idea for a project on objectification. It was a commentary on the over-sexualization of women in rap music and culture. On the day of the pitch to the class, he waited until the very end to speak. He presented the idea of reappropriating album covers, replacing the revealing images of women with men to make a point. Then sheepishly he said, I kind of feel bad presenting this idea because I'm like a white guy, you know? What? No, erupted a voice from the, in the room. It was the voice of one of two black students. It can't just be me, she exclaimed. We all have to fight this together. All creative forms, especially those that speak to a collective, have the potential to inspire people to resist. Poet W.H. Auden famously wrote these lines. For poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper flows on south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in, 
it survives a way of happening, a mouth. Since 1991, a poetry festival in Colombia has been transformative in a community that was plagued by violence. In Medellin, Colombia, poetry has been a way of happening, a mouth to counter violence. In his article titled, Medellin's Poems of Peace in The Guardian, Benjamin Ball writes about this surprise phenomenon, and I'm quoting Ball here. Medellin is the world capital of poetry. This is no small achievement. In 1991, Medellin, the capital of Colombia's mountainous coffee region, was the most violent city in the world and a global center for drug trafficking. Festival organizer Fernando Rondion told me that it was founded in this context as a form of cultural resistance, a voice for peace, and a protest against injustice and terrorism, including state terrorism. The festival is now the largest of its kind in the world. Over eight days, free poetry recitals are held in public parks, university theaters, high security prisons, and schools and libraries in poor, marginalized suburbs. To date, Medellin has hosted 820 poets from 142 countries and many indigenous nations. Colombia is still a volatile country, but Medellin is no longer a place where the majority live in fear. Nonviolence theory and practice. Nonviolence as a strategy for social change. Nonviolence as a foundation for a pedagogy. The term nonviolence provokes many responses. Nothing to think about here. I'm not violent. What is there to talk about? Teaching is nonviolent. I am not advocating violence, but be realistic. Do you think that the powerful will just give up their privileges? What is missing for many, perhaps most of us, is a real understanding of how transformative social change actually takes place. Or much awareness, really, about the history of nonviolence. Susan Neiman's Learning from the Germans is an enlightening exploration of what peoples addressing the legacies of institutionalized systems of racism can learn from Germany's efforts to confront meaningfully their own. She examines the strengths, but also weaknesses of Germany's approach, to being the failure to focus enough on how it came to pass or inspire the next generation with the possibility of resistance, even to the Nazis. There are many monuments street and school names to commemorate Germany's most famous resistance heroes. The Munich University students, Hans and Sophie Scholl, were arrested and executed for printing and distributing anti-Nazi leaflets. Niemann writes, there is no contesting their courage, but the only consequences of their actions was to console later generations of Germans that not everyone capitulated to Nazi terror. For millions of Germans who capitulated this simply reinforces the idea that capitulation was the only rational thing to do, unless you happen to have a taste for martyrdom. There is, in contrast, only a single monument to the only successful nonviolent protest that took place in Nazi Germany, in a little park on a side street. Usually empty, stands three reddish sandstone statues to remember the bravery and triumph of hundreds of non-Jewish wives who protested in February 1943 in Berlin, right next to the SS headquarters, the arrest and soon to be deportation of their Jewish husbands. They came every night after work, heedless to the Gestapo guns that were brought out to confront them. They stayed for more than a week. They prevailed. Their husbands were released. Their story for Germans, for all of us, in contrast to the Shawls, is certainly more threatening to those who lived at the time, but is also much more inspiring to the rest of us. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds. 
and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration, a hundred fill a hall, a thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter, 10,000 power and your own paper, a hundred thousand your own media, 10 million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again and they say no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. And each day you mean one more. Nonviolence, so often devalued and forgotten, has a transformative power that few of us recognize. Resistance scholar and activist Dallin Vinfagan emphasizes that to reclaim its power, nonviolence must be understood as including actions that are simultaneously without violence and against violence. Its transformative potential comes in part from its capacity to reveal contradictions in unexpected ways. And this is most visible in actions that are not only against and without violence, but also, as he puts it, beyond violence. At the same time, moving us by the courage of those involved, revealing a gross injustice that many of us had not really noticed and inspiring us with an alternative vision. What these actions have in common is that they are dramatic and creative. This moves us to see links between the activist and the artist, providing us with a way to bring the work of social change into the classroom. Stephen Duncombe and Steve Lambert for the cent from the Center for Artistic Activism acknowledged that the term artistic activism seems like an oxymoron, but like most paradoxes, it contains a deeper and more incisive truth. They explain the connections this way, and uh, this is a quote. At first glance, these aims seem at odds with one another. Activism moves the material world, while art moves the heart, body, and soul. In fact, however, they are complementary. Social change doesn't just happen. It happens because people decide to make change. Art and activism often conform to expectations. And for many people, those expectations are, unfortunately, negative. Artistic activism is activism that doesn't look like activism and art that doesn't look like art. The ability of artistic activism to surprise us, to show up in unlikely places, for example, not in a gallery, or take on unfamiliar forms, for example, not a protest march, provides an opportunity to disrupt people's preconceived notions of art and protest and their predetermined ideas about the messages we are trying to communicate. Artistic activism creates an opportunity to bypass seemingly fixed political ideas and moral ideals and remap cognitive patterns. Surprise is a moment when hearts can be touched and minds reached and both changed. Meanwhile, back in the classroom, uh, in the class uh, that I was doing uh, about media and rape culture, I showed the hashtag, this is not consent image again. And I asked a few questions. Um, students' reflections on this campaign and the use of artistic activism allowed for students to enter into a complex discussion about a difficult topic from a common starting point. Although everyone brought their own impressions, each person left with the understanding that this is a reaction to something profoundly biased in many cultures. They can research, or they could, and they did, um, research the campaign's motivations. Um, in a classroom, they can discover the story of the defense attorney in Ireland using a woman's choice of panties as a justification for rape. They can research uh, why so many sexual assaults are not reported. Um, they can study the resistance to this thing we call rape culture without the conversation becoming polarized or hurtful. Um, the unexpected has a way of puncturing our shells, if even for a short moment, and these surprises can lead to larger openings if they occur regularly. If all goes well, students might want to develop 
a campaign of their own um, and respond creatively to what is being learned. In some cases in my classroom, uh, that has looked like this. Um, or uh, this. Using stories and art in the classroom offers safe spaces for silent contemplation and personal growth. Suddenly a student who felt angry or powerless about a certain issue feels compelled to make work that will get people to think about it in a different way and possibly act towards a shared goal. There is strength in creating that thing and even more in learning how to express one's truth in a space where others are taking a similar risk. By engaging in this activity with our students, we explore our agency, creativity, vision, and vulnerability as a team. Admitting when things are not where we might want them to be. This work, this shared vulnerability takes practice. It has to become a habit. The use of the word habit is significant here. Sarah Ahmed, who in Living a Feminist Life, asks us to create more equal relationships with one another, describes whiteness as a habit. And a habit links to the latest research in prejudice studies. 30 years ago, Patricia Devine first defended the idea that people could be unconscious racists, skeptical of the significance of interventions that seek to directly change implicit or unintentional biases, as she refers to them now, she asks us to consider them as an unwanted habit to be broken through a combination of motivation, awareness, and effort. We think this strategy offers further insights into the power of the resist violence pedagogy. As students' awareness of the suffering inflicted by violence in its many forms increases, they are also encouraged to pay attention to the violence that shapes their lives, reflect the possibility of change, and actively begin to find creative ways to resist violence they are potentially developing an everyday habit of resistance. How do we break the unwanted habit of acting from the sort of unintentional biases that underwrite various kinds of violence and develop the positive habit of actively practicing nonviolence, nonviolence in the sense of acting without violence and against violence, while also influencing others to do the same? How do we initiate or foster this process in the classroom if, if there is opportunity for students to embrace um, their creative potential as a path towards social change. Uh, um, if it doesn't happen overnight, but this affirmative shift can be witnessed in the classroom if there's an opportunity for students to embrace their creative potential as a path towards social change. The beauty of studying and create, um, engaging in artistic activism in the classroom is that no one has to be an expert, but everyone finds connections with one another by trying. Art can connect people. Um, we know from a 2004 RAND study that, quote, the communicative nature of the arts, the personal nature of creative expression, and the trust associated with revealing one's creativity to others may make joint arts activities particularly conducive to forging social bonds and bridges across social divides. That the present driving force of today's activism is young people reminds us that the necessity for making more room for this kind of experience regularly in the classroom. As a group of teachers encouraging the study and practice of nonviolence in the classroom, we have seen that the critique and creative production of art in such a context provides an opportunity to develop collective experiences that are themselves transformative. You have a poem to offer. It is made of action. You must search for it. Run outside and give your life to it. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, before we go to uh, 
question and uh, answer. I was hoping that I could uh, show you our Resist Violence website uh, with a few of the resources that are there. Um, how, what's, how's our time, Michelle? Is it okay? We're, we have time, yes. Okay, okay, good. So I will do that. Um, How do I do that? Where am I? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a moment here. I'm just going to try to find the right way. I think I did. Let's share. There we go. Are you seeing a website that says resist violence? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so that worked out pretty well. Um, so, um, we, over the past uh, two or three years, have been kind of compiling a, a website for um, resources and uh, stories, stories like the ones that you've uh, seen here are on our blog. Um, we've got a few of them, reflections on how we're working in the classroom, some of the things that we're influenced by, um, reviews of films um, and, and books and things like that. Um, and we also have uh, an ongoing newsletter, which I highly encourage you to, um, if you're interested in what we presented here, please subscribe. Um, we don't send it out. Don't worry, we won't uh, bombard your mailbox. In fact, we're sometimes too occupied <laughs> or too busy to send it as uh, often as we would like. But we try to send them seasonal, like if we can, hopefully by the end of fall, we'll have a fall newsletter. That's what we're hoping. <laughs> Um, so on the site, there's a student work that you can look at. Um, there are, for those of you who are possibly thinking like, okay, I'm really not an artsy person. How would I do this? Um, there's a getting started page. Um, and within that uh, page, there are different uh, kind of resources that uh, we hope you can look at. Uh, some of them video-based uh, where students that have been part of the pedagogy um, created for us uh, last summer. Um, and there are different things to kind of uh, look at, uh, things that hopefully inspire you on the site. We have ideas for the classroom, which if you click on will uh, bring you to um, some interesting kind of like, um, you know, assignment ideas, uh, discussion group ideas, etc. We have our foundational uh, resources page that also has resources that we think are good for it, how, who, whatever kind of course you're giving, we kind of think these are really um, kind of key. Um, and then we have modules and I'll show you our latest module that was created by Pat uh, in the waking hours of last evening. I say this because I was kind of late getting it uh, on the website and published, um, but uh, it was kind of created over the summer and it's the demilitarization uh, module. We have others on uh, othering, uh, rape culture and media violence. Um, so if you uh, click on to any of the modules, um, hopefully they can be rich and uh, useful for you. Um, we always kind of pair up uh, someone who is maybe a philosopher on the, or talking about uh, the issue intellectually uh, on one side, paired up with someone who, who has done artistic work on the other. Um, we try to give starting points as like thoughts related to a module like this and how you would kind of uh, delve into it. Um, we often kind of have a, um, a featured artist or a featured campaign that we think might be good for the classroom. Um, we deal with students who are college age, so of the ages of around 17 to around 22, 3, 4, 5, um, depending on uh, how, when they came into our college. Um, and we kind of focus on three main things. We kind of think like, like artistic activists or like activists in general, people who are kind of uh, thinking about nonviolence as something to um, engage in, we see that oftentimes there are three main kind of components to their success or their ability to communicate with others and get others on board. One of them is critical thinking, the other is media literacy and creative expression. And if uh, there are opportunities for you to work within the modules to do um, these, th these three things, um, then, you know, it's not a surefire thing, but it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's a good thing to kind of keep these things um, together um, and try to address them, maybe not all at once, but at certain points during the, uh, during the, the uh, delving into this, uh, into any module or any kind of uh, resist violence pedagogy. So um, we've got like an annotated bibliography 
um, of resources um, that you can look at. And some of them are accessible online. So we've, we've made a click here option. Some of them are not. Um, so in those cases, we kind of say, um, you know, are probably widely available or hopefully you can find them. And then of course, at the very end, um, sorry, not at the very end, before that, um, we like to share um, student work that has been done in our classes that reflect on the theme of the module. Um, and then uh, we ask that you share. Uh, if, do you have assignments or hands outs or stories that you'd like to share that you think are kind of um, interesting? Maybe, you know, we're, we're more than uh, happy to, to look at them and, and maybe we could exchange in that way. Um, that's, that's what we've got. This is kind of what we do and uh, what we've been working on um, very proudly for the past um, couple of years. So I will now stop the share and uh, open up for any questions. Thank you so much for having us, by the way. Thank you for a wonderfully rich uh, presentation. If um, people will uh, type their questions into the chat, I think we may all need a little moment to recompose our thoughts. Of course. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're so pleased to be here. Oh, you've given me like 12 ideas for a class I'm teaching next semester. So <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, so, uh, well, Swasti just says, thank you so much. Great work. <laughs> Thanks, Swasti. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just comment. I love the use of the sunglasses to switch persona. That was Allison's idea and I forgot why. That was why. delightful. <laughs> <laughs> because I noticed the first pair of sunglasses before you got to it. And I thought, what is this? This is interesting. <laughs> so I thought that was a lovely visual. Um, it's hard in Zoom sometimes to, to connect. And I thought that that worked very, very nicely. And also the judicious use of PowerPoint slides with speaking. Um, the the very structure of the the presentation it was a performance and i appreciate that <laughs> very much <laughs> i think you know a part of this project uh working interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way and uh mm -hmm. i think pat and i recognized how much we bring to each other um you know we were filling in each other's gaps you know mm -hmm. because i was in mm -hmm. cinema communications i was bringing more of an arts feel to what we were discussing and and vice versa i needed more um depth to what i was bringing to the classroom and so i think we uh we hoped that that would be the case if we opened it up to a larger community of practice and it definitely seems to have um worked that way as well well we have a question from julia um, who also loved the sunglasses. Um, <laughs> and thanks you for sharing your personal teaching stories and the, uh, and the pedagogical resources. Um, and then Wendy asked, uh, says, Susan talked about the poem and how she felt about how she dealt with it. Could you talk about how your community of practice can support this pedagogy? Which yeah. Which sort of started um, talking about. Exactly. Already. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, um, I hope to draw a sort of distinction between um, how I, I dealt with it without any um, sense of a resist violence pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, my first instinct was um, defensiveness, more because of the tone of the student, mm -hmm. you know, even being aware that students who are sometimes 16 years old, 17, um, you know, they, they, they can't always control for tone, right? Um, it's a it's a learned thing that that um, that we learn to manage. I think in adulthood, you know, um, instead of in a sort of um, oppositional way to an mm -hmm. authority figure or parent. So the resist violence pedagogy would certainly um, now, with with what I know now, I would be prepared for um, resistance. And I wouldn't try to supply or foreclose instead of saying, well, it's evident this, that this, um, the, the person in the poem, Ellen, that's spoken to was sexually assaulted. I would say, you know, um, 
what do you what has happened to her even though it seems like an obvious question um i would let the students give um you know a fuller account of what happened even if that started out with she was raped then i could then say well what is it that makes you certain of that and or what makes i usually you know now i would probably say um can you ground your intuition in a detail in the text mm -hmm. um which is to honor the um the intuition and um you know in a very gentle way get them to sort of um Ex, you know, know that they have knowledge that they bring to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that the whole goal of an anal analysis of poetry is not to impose our preconceptions on a poem, but to see what the, the, the writer has done, um, which might surprise us, which might challenge those preconceptions. Why did why doesn't the writer say that she was raped? Um, why, why make that in a, a kind of elision? And so the resist um, violence pedagogy has made me more open to, um, I think I was cognizant of my own vulnerability as a person before because I, I approached, um, you know, teaching through a feminist pedagogy, which is not top down, which is, um, you know, definitely um, a, a shared dynamic in the classroom. But now I'm not as uncomfortable, I believe, when students challenge me, I sort of hope for it, that that's an opportunity to, to then look at our assumptions um, neutrally as though it's not, you know, me as a teacher who's being challenged or the student who might identify with the victim, but that we all have emotions that we bring to writing and it is, it's actually, um, you know, uh, I think designed that way to to lift those emotions from us mm -hmm. so that we can look at them. Well, John Gatz has a has a question. Um, he's kind of channeling something I was thinking. And um, he asks about um, uh, administrative support for the project. You, you know, sometimes it's challenging to get support for interdisciplinary work. Have you found Dawson to be supportive? I'll, I'll take that, I guess, Kim. Go, uh, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think Dawson really um, is a college that has supported a lot of innovative uh, projects and pedagogy. And, and maybe to clarify, because I don't know if this is really obvious, this really all began with a, 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 in a project called Learning Communities, which was about pairing courses together. Mm -hmm. So um, Kim and I, um, me rather reluctantly and a little nervous because it meant, you know, being in each other's classrooms. Uh, so that was sort of a, a new thing and I had to get over that. Um, but we, we paired a, a very theory research oriented course, my humanities class with a hands-on class. Uh, so we had them back to back, we had the same students and we were in, you know, each mm -hmm. other's classes. And uh, that's, just um, I think that was transformative and it's it, and it led us to uh, realize that something significant was happening in that class that um, there was a depth of engagement that we had never seen despite having been successful in, you know sometimes <laughs> in their teaching right something really significant was happening and and that was really the starting point of this whole um, uh, you know developing this as a pedagogy and trying to figure out what was going on in the classroom and, and I think what really inspired us or me in particular was finding out how much what we were doing was really backed up by theory in these different fields, whether you're mm -hmm. looking at educational philosophy or you're looking at social, sci uh, social psychology or really uh, nonviolence theory and, and looking particularly at Stella and Binthagen's work that it just was so much of what was, they were talking about was what we were bringing in the classroom intuitively in a large sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, want to add so yeah and I, I think from an administrative stamp I, I say this often about this project is that it wouldn't exist if we weren't at Dawson I think like uh, I mm -hmm. I uh, we do um, generally get a lot of support from uh, administration to um, to kind of take on these experiments if you will you know um, and however to expand the community of practice was through a grant um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, we got grant money and then, uh, of course, you know, um, of course, the administration was supportive, you know, um, but it did require that, you know, four people in four different disciplines with four different seniorities, you know, ha you know, were getting release time to do. I mean, this was something mm -hmm. that required a bit of work on their part. And for sure, we, we had that support 
So I think we are kind of lucky to to be where we are. Allison, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to say this is something that's quite unusual because I teach part time in two institutions. So I was just amazed that Dawson was uh, able to support me as a part time teacher to participate that. And so that was thanks to, I guess, Kim and um, Pat and Dawson, but also my own chair who really was quite supportive of this effort. So mm -hmm. I don't know, would never see it in a university as far as I know. <laughs> well, yes. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna exercise my prerogative as facilitator to kind of tag on to John's question and ask um, if you've tried, the community of learning sounds wonderful, but have you also tried um, having you know visitors in your classroom. We've done this with our peace building and social justice courses where we invite people in to um, talk from their disciplinary perspective or to do an activity with students. And is that something that you've tried at Dawson that has worked? Maybe informally, I'm, I, I don't know if it's as formal as what you're speaking of, but uh... I think informally, perhaps uh, we've ours we've... is a little bit informal. It's okay. basically, you know, um, if my if if a colleague is teaching the history of Africa and knows that I teach um, African West African literature, he'll send me a syllabus and say, "Pick a spot and oh, cool. come talk to the students." So it's kind of the relationship amongst colleagues and friends, mm -hmm. but. I'm already thinking about people I'm going to invite to do some things uh, That's awesome. in this way. Now we have another question, okay. this one from Clabel. Since you are using art and difficult topics, have you looked into art therapy? I wonder if it would complement or provide other ideas about how to develop the projects for your classes. I wish the one of the members of our community of practice were here to answer that. She <laughs> psychology, um, mm -hmm. and, but she couldn't be here, unfortunately. Um, have we really, I don't know, have we thought about that? Um, I'm looking at everyone in our community practice, sort of, but I don't know. Yeah. I guess I would say sort of in the sense that we recognize and are, and are um, in a sense using art for students to work through, right? Mm -hmm. uh, their anger, their frustration, their sense of, of um, um, I guess, you know, in desire to do something, right? So in that mm -hmm. sense, we're definitely not, uh, definitely tapping into the psychological benefits of mm -hmm. art. So I think in that sense, yes, but not in a, uh, you know, not in a more, I guess, you know, in that general sense. I mm -hmm. also would like to add, I don't know if this kind of fits, Michelle, with what you're saying, but turning it kind of the other way and bringing our, our work to um, the, the larger community is mm -hmm. that, we also um, have an exhibit at the end where students mm -hmm. uh, present their uh, works of artistic activism. And the last one was virtual and you can actually visit it um, mm -hmm. all the tension and <laughs> visit it on, on, our, on our website. But yeah, so that was another way to sort of engage the larger community and have teachers coming in and then thinking about um, how they might be able to apply the pedagogy. And actually, that, that was one of the art. things that was one of the things I was thinking of. We have a small art gallery here on campus and um, they very kindly when I did a sabbatical project that involved paper making and book binding and artist books gave me space and time to have a show of that work at the end of the sabbatical. And I think they would really love to do that with students too. Yeah. And I'll now go back to being a good facilitator <laughs> and ask uh, Julia's question, would some of the resist violence activities be suitable or appropriate for student workshops outside of a class? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I definitely think so. And hi, Julia, we know who you are. <laughs> and we should, we should talk, um, yeah. Um, I, I definitely think so, um, particularly in a in perhaps in a situation that we're not in right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know if you can hear me. Am I breaking yeah. up? Maybe. Well, you're frozen, but I can hear your voice. Now you're moving again. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. You know, a, a situation where 
Oh, good. Like a situation. Yeah, I can. Um, you know, I think particularly in a situation where maybe students aren't as overwhelmed as they seem to be now. I don't mm -hmm. know about anyone else, but in my classes, I feel like we're, we're going to make it to the end, mm -hmm. but barely, you know? Um, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Actually, that might be a great release for students outside of the stresses of making it to the end of the semester. Um, Swasti asks if you, ah, oh, so you read it and you put it in there. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. If there are questions out there. Can I just jump into kind of taking Julia's in another direction as well? I think one of the things that we are trying to um, encourage is bringing art into the theory research oriented discipline mm -hmm. and bringing a more critical thinking perspective into the creative discipline. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the only concern I would have in sort of saying an activity could work really well. I mean, I think there's a place for it, but it's really the idea of bringing both, right? So mm -hmm. the students really know when they're engaging in some work of art that they are engaging in the work of social change. How does that happen? You know, they, they thought, talk a little bit about and explore a little bit how social change happens, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of resistance, you know, all that, those kinds of elements as well. So it's really the combination I think gives the power to what we've been seeing. I know that when I've had students do creative projects in some of my culture classes, part of the assignment is to write a critical introduction to the work that they're presenting. So they talk about how they're applying what they've learned, uh, where they've drawn inspiration, um, so that they're both doing, creating, but also thinking about that process and uh, developing an ability to talk about that process. Um, and we have another comment. Um, it's related to what you're saying. Actually. Yeah, I love how the artistic activism gives students an opportunity to focus on what interests them and enter into it to the degree they are ready to deal with. Mm -hmm. Do most students engage? Are there students that resist expressing themselves in this way? Um, in yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that, but I think maybe Allison and Sue, you, I mean, you also teach poetry and animation. And so I think um, maybe we could all um, try, but, you know, um, I haven't seen an instance where students resist explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I've, I've seen instances where students are reluctant but then they kind of see what other students are doing and it inspires them a little bit mm -hmm. or um, you as a teacher or facilitator try to find that right example mm -hmm. of what is going to hit home for them. And then they kind of like, oh, okay, okay. I could work in that way. Um, I don't know. I, you know, it's funny. We have one of our alumni here, uh, Maria, I see your name. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing that happens with a dynamic of like the concept of, you know, we're working towards something and oftentimes mm -hmm. the groups will come up with a theme mm -hmm. and that theme, a lot of students will want to work towards. There are definitely students who really feel uncomfortable in a creative mm -hmm. expression format, mm -hmm. right? Like they don't um, sense that they're going to be okay with that, but they mm -hmm. do feel okay helping others. Mm -hmm. you know or they or they do feel okay kind of like promoting mm -hmm. what's going on, or they're real social media savvy and they you know can connect to other community groups or whatever it is so um I, you know they, they always seem to find a way to engage um mm -hmm. either they're making their own independent work all the time sometimes mm -hmm. not. they become kind of like part of another team or another group mm -hmm. or get involved in another way. I don't know if that properly explains the-, the can, I, can I speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I wanted to, to say that in, in the poetry community, um, it's it's not just, uh, you know, the poets who matter. Audience is so important. Mm -hmm. All the people that love and support poetry. And I think it's, it's um, I noticed that when I ask students to write poetry, some, um, you know, just del delve into it and they love it. And others have a really 
a, a harder time getting to a place where they can just say something mm-hmm. um, and and will take a risk. So I always reward risk taking over product mm-hmm. uh, now that it's it's really about, you know, um, rolling up your sleeves and trying something. Mm-hmm. And um, and I lower the bar quite a bit, which sounds counter productive but after the shooting at Dawson I did learn that compassion and teaching for me is the most important thing Mm -hmm. I mean I used to be you know what I thought of as like you know uh really rigorous and I you know my mantra is be as precise as possible whenever possible as a Mm -hmm. poet and as a scholar um and not that I've let let my standards fall but I've refocused them on compassion um and this somehow just saying well you can write shit if you want you know um (laughs) just be okay with that has somehow been freeing for students and for me and I see really interesting work that way I've told my students that sometimes it's a lot like in diving or in gymnastics there are degree of difficulty points so if you try something that's That's more difficult Yes. You're not as successful as a person who did something that was much easier. You're going to be rewarded for taking on that degree of difficulty. And that seems yeah. to help them think about or be more willing to take risks. That's a really good analogy. Yeah, it really is. Can we borrow that? You may have it. <laughs> Feel <Yeah>. free. <laughs> Well, because I'm always asking my students to do things and they look at me and they say, well, no one's ever asked me to write a paper like that before. And I said, yeah, I know. That's why I want you to write it. Mm, yeah. And I'm taking that into consideration. This is the first time you're doing this or anything like this. Mm-hmm. So you get props for taking on something that's ambitious and difficult. Yeah. Um, Gabriel says, I've just taught one creative writing course, writing fairy tales. But I made the statement of poetics worth as much as the final draft for just that reason, to create value for risk taking. And I would echo Gabriel and say that's one of the reasons I thought of you write a critical introduction to the work. So I can say to the students, maybe you don't feel all that artistic, but I want you to take that chance and be able to talk about what you were doing. Um, How you came to it, what your inspiration was, and then it makes them feel better if they're worried about their grade. (laughs) <laughs> is there something that that offsets that yeah that's interesting that's a good strategy well i think we have time for one more question or con uh, or comment i'm mindful of time and it's friday night but i think we can do one more or perhaps not Well, let me invite you all to um, give our panel a rousing hand of virtual applause. Um, And thank you again for this wonderfully rich program. I know I learned a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. I will take a moment to remind folks that our very last October program um, in storytelling and social justice is storytelling, scholarship, and activism. Two of the presenters have been here in the audience. It will start at one o'clock Pacific time, one to 2.30 Pacific time and four to 5.30 Eastern time. And then we'll begin again in November, on November 10th with polarization in a time of misinformation and political strife, water, climate and energy change. Um, You're all here so you know how to register. I encourage you to register for November and I'll look forward to seeing perhaps some of you tomorrow. I'm facilitating again, some of you tomorrow afternoon and others among you in November when we take on polarization, which I fear may be all too apt a a subject for the month. Thank you again very much. Thank you. 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 Thanks so much for having us. Thank Thank you. you for coming and and performing and all of that it was 